All righty, it is the top of the hour. My name is Mike Shogren. Welcome to How to Create Indestructible Wealth with Multifamily Apartments. Uh, let's see, what do I want to do here while we kick it off? This is a new software that I am using here for webinars, so give me just a second. So let's see here. All right. Before we kick it off, I'm just going to check the chat room here. If you can hear me, please say yes. And if you can see the presentation, please give me a yes before we move forward here. Okay. All right. Well, let's kick things off then. Uh, switch over. Okay. So before we kick things off, um, today is Veterans Day, so I want to take a moment just to say thank you to all the veterans out there. If you are a veteran, thank you for your service. Um, I truly appreciate everything you've done for us and for this country, and without you, we wouldn't be sitting here on this Friday afternoon having lunch and talking about making money with real estate. So thank you from the bottom of my heart and happy Veterans Day. So the purpose of today's webinar is we're gonna talk about why I believe multifamily apartments are the best investment, um, hands down, based on all the benefits that you get from cash flow, equity, uh, tax benefits, all that, uh, why now is a phenomenal time to invest in apartment communities. Uh, we'll go through the three steps to building indestructible wealth with apartments, and then we'll talk about how to jumpstart your portfolio. And a quick disclaimer I need to run through, uh, the goal of this presentation is to educate you on the benefits of investing in real estate. This does not constitute an offer or a solicitation to purchase securities. An offer can only be made by private placement memorandum. Another disclaimer, I am a CPA, but I'm not your CPA. This is not intended to give you legal or tax or investment advice. This is strictly for educational purposes. So please consult your own attorney and your own tax advisor before making any investment decisions. All right. So a little bit about me. Um, again, my name is Mike Shogren. Um, my background is I am a CPA, I'm a finance guy. Uh, I am the co-founder of SNA Capital. We're a private real estate investment company focusing on income producing apartment communities in emerging markets across the US. It sounds like a mouthful, but we'll get into a little bit more details about that later. Um, prior to starting this company, um, I came out of school with an accounting degree, started my career in uh, public accounting as an auditor. Um, I was placed in the real estate development and affordable housing industry. So I was working with clients who were building affordable housing, um, auditing their financial statements, reviewing their leases, ticking and tying out all the numbers for them so that they could get the incentives from the state and federal government for running those types of programs. Uh, from there, I moved on and moved into a finance role for an international energy company, a multi-billion dollar company, very exciting stuff. Um, I was working on large, complex, unusual transactions, assessing the impacts on the company. Um, very cool role. Um, but a couple years ago, everything changed when two things happened probably within a week of each other. The first was um, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Now, up until this point, um, by most people's standards, I was a pretty successful guy. Um, you know, I'd come up, got a good degree in accounting, quote unquote, went on, got a good job, got another good job, got my MBA, got my CPA, had a beautiful wife, beautiful home, everything was going good. Um, and then I read this book and it literally changed my outlook on everything. Um, more so than any accounting class, any degree, MBA, everything. Um, this book literally changed my life and it got me to take a closer look at, at what I was doing with my money. Um, and how I was managing it and um, the steps I needed to take to move forward and really achieve financial freedom and achieve my goals. And around the same time, I looked up my 401k portfolio through my employer 
and I had been reviewing the, the quarterly statements and everything. And it looked like, you know, my balance was increasing because I was putting in, you know, making, you know, exceptional contributions. Um, but when I actually went back and recalculated everything, my average return for the prior three years was 0.53%. That is disgusting. I could have done better with a treasury bond. Um, which, you know, that was very eye-opening for me. I was frustrated. I felt violated. I felt played. You know, I, you know, I, I thought I was a, an educated guy and, you know, shame on me for not catching this earlier. And from that point, I was determined to, to take control of my finances. And in, in Robert Kiyosaki's book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, he has an entire chapter called Mind Your Own Business. And most people, they think that their business is, you know, if you're a doctor, if you're an accountant, if you're a laborer, whatever your, your job title is, that's your business. Well, that's where you make your money, but your business is actually managing your finances and, you know, what are you investing in? And you need to mine that business. You can't just blindly hand it over to somebody and hope that, you know, keep your fingers crossed and then in 40 years you can just retire. You know, fortunately I caught this at a young age and it just motivated me to take control and to, to really dig deep and educate myself so that I could provide my family with the future that I wanted to provide them with. Um, so what I did, I started going to real estate meetups. Um, I knew some folks who were in the real estate industry, they were doing well. Um, some of them were flipping houses. So I went to a free house flipping seminar one weekend and you know that was great. I ended up going to you know, a three day boot camp and learned a ton. But when I came back home and kind of reflected on everything I had learned, you know, it just, it didn't meet my skill set. Um, I knew very little, if anything, about rehabbing a property. Um, I'm not a handy guy. I'm great with a calculator. You don't want me around a hammer or a screwdriver. Um, and that's just me. Um, so, you know, I kept going. I kept attending these local meetups. And one day I came across a presentation from one of my first mentors and it was on investing in apartments and it just clicked. Um, it, you know, it's very financial based. It's, it's all about the numbers. Everything made sense. The economy is a scale, everything. And I'll get into that in just a second. Um, so I want to share everything I learned from him and from all of my other mentors along the way. Um, talk about how you can get started. The, the, tried and true proven plan to building incredible wealth with multifamily apartments, regardless of what's going on in the economy. Um, and we'll go through that and we'll talk a little bit about how you can jumpstart or expedite that process at the end of this webinar. So moving on. So it's, these are the, the common investment options. I'll touch on them briefly. So you have your stocks. Um, they're volatile because they're based on fair market value, they're, they're liquid. You can buy and sell um, instantly um, in today's world. So when crazy things happen, whether it's a presidential election or Brexit or any strange things that happen in the world and people don't know what's gonna come out of it, um, it ripples through the economy, it ripples through the stock market. And the values of stocks are just based on endless objective and subjective factors that are completely outside of my control. Um, so then you have, you know, flipping homes. You've got great profits if you do it right. Um, you can buy them at a discount so you don't have to pay fair market value. But it is active income. It is not passive. It is definitely a, a job. Once you stop flipping homes, the money stops coming in. Um, you're not getting income during the rehab. And there's no recurring income once you sell it. Once the project's done, it's done. And it's taxed as ordinary income, which means once you make a twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollar profit, hopefully if things go well, which is awesome, you get taxed at the full ordinary income rate, which is not the case with longer term investments, which I'll talk about in a second. So single family rentals, they're great for long term wealth. Um, the debt gets paid down by the residents living in the property. Um, the problem is is there's little to no cash flow once uh, all the bills are paid. You funded some reserves for the new roof, the new boiler, everything. There's really not a lot of meat left on the bone at the end of the day. Um, so you're left with active management. You've got to be the landlord. It's very difficult to find a property manager who will do a single family home um, and still allow you to receive cash flow every month. So 
if you're a handy person and you don't mind being a landlord and learning the landlord tenant laws, it's a great option for you. Um, for me, th that wasn't the route that I wanted to take. Um, so uh, let's take a look at small multifamily. So when I say small, I'm talking one to four units. Um, so they're, again, they're great for long-term wealth. The debt is paid down by the resident. Again, there's really little to no cash flow. You can get a property management company in there. They're going to charge you about 10% of collected rents plus lease-up fees. So typically, once a, a resident leaves, they will the property manager will charge you one month's rent to fill that unit. Now, the problem with the, the single-family rentals and the small multifamily rentals is there's a big vacancy risk. Now, what I mean by that is if you have one unit or four units, if one tenant leaves, you're either 100% vacant or you're 25% vacant, um, which can drastically eat up your, your profits for the year. So if you're generating you know, $1,500 a month in rent and your expenses are $1,200 a month, you know that $300 profit that you made that month, if, if you have a vacancy for one month at you know, $1,200 in expenses, that eats up your profits for four months. So it, it's very difficult to, to cash flow with those types of properties. So why I love multifamily apartments. Now multifamily apartments is anything five units and above. Um, that's basically just how the banks look at it. If you have five or more units, they, the rules of the game change. And I can go through that in a little bit. What really happens though is the economy is a scale kick in right around 150 units because you can afford, you have enough revenue coming in from that type of property where you can afford to have on-site professional property management, on-site maintenance. They handle all the requests, all the leasing, all the maintenance, all the contracts. They do the day-to-day -day management and you manage the manager. Um, and the, the big, big difference, which we're gonna dive into today, is how multifamily apartments are valued. The value of an apartment complex is based on the income that it produces, not the comparable sales like single families or one to four fourplexes. And I will get into that in just a second. Again, I, I touched on the vacancy risk. If you've got 200 units and you've got one vacancy or 10 vacancies or 20 vacancies, you can absorb those those vacancy losses because you have so many more units it's not a big deal so there is a much lower vacancy risk with larger apartment complexes you can verify before you buy so what i mean by that is when we put a an apartment complex under contract we will have anywhere from 45 to 60 days to go in and verify everything that the seller has told us so if the property is based on the income that it produces, we'll go in there and audit their financial statements for the past two years. We'll audit all the leases, all the contracts. We'll hire professional property inspectors to inspect every single unit to make sure that we identify any potential issues. We'll hire an attorney to go through or do all the legal due diligence. And we'll do all of that before we decide to move forward. And if we find anything that the seller didn't mention, then we go back to the seller and we'll say, listen, we based our offer on what you told us, but we found X, Y, and Z. Therefore, we have to reduce our uh, offer price. And if they accept, great. If they don't, we get our full deposit back. So that's a, a huge, huge um, asset to have. Make sure you have the right teams in place to go in there, do all the due diligence so you're comfortable. The day you close, you know exactly what you're buying. Multifamily apartments, they generate passive income. When you buy a multifamily apartment, like I mentioned earlier, you have professional property management on site. Yes, you still need to check in with them on a regular basis, or you can hire an asset manager to do that for you, and then you just deal with the asset manager. But for the most part, it is passive. You're not going in there fixing toilets and dealing with termites and tenants and legal issues if you've got evictions. All of that is handled. You don't have to deal with any of that. You are the CEO and you are running the business. 
and the property management and all the contractors are working for you. Uh, multifamily apartments offer amazing tax benefits. I'm not going to get into political views or anything, but a lot of folks complained about why Donald Trump may not have paid income tax. A huge piece of that is because of depreciation. Basically, depreciation says if you buy a building, over time, the government says, well, that building is going to be worth less over time. So on your tax return, you can take a deduction every single year for the amount of that property being reduced. It's a non-cash item. No cash comes out of the bank account, but you get to take a write-off on your tax return, which is huge. So you get to keep more of the profits in your pocket every single year. Another benefit, you're building up equity through amortization. Every single month, residents pay you rent, which goes to paying all the expenses, and it goes to paying down the mortgage. As the mortgage gets paid down on the property, your equity goes up. The property also appreciates in two ways. Now with single families and fourplexes, um, it only appreciates based on the market. So if the market's appreciating, the property appreciates. In multifamily, again, if the market appreciates, the property goes up in value. But you can also force the appreciation because the value is based on the income. So if a property brings in $100,000 now, it's worth X. But if you can increase the income to $120,000, then the property is worth more. So you actually control how much the property is worth, which is huge. And I'll go through an example of that in just a minute. Uh, you have leverage. So some of you may be thinking, how the heck can I afford a 200-unit apartment complex right now? Well, through leverage, you use other people's money. You use the bank. The bank is happy to lend on these properties because they know they're stable cash producing assets. Banks will finance up to 80 to 90% non-recourse, meaning with a single family home, if you're underwater or something happens and somebody sues you, they can take the home and they can come after your personal assets. Non-recourse loans, the worst they can do is take the property back. They cannot touch your personal assets. In addition, you can invest through syndications, which most multifamily investors do. All that means is a group of investors with similar goals pool their money together, and rather than buy a fourplex on their own, they'll all throw in, say, $50,000, pool their money together so they can buy the 100 to 200 unit complex together, hire um, professional property management, typically the syndicator or the deal sponsor that puts the whole thing together, is the general partner. All the other investors are limited partners. They get all the same benefits, um, but the general partner has the experience, the teams, and the track record to show that this is what we do, this is how we can execute, and everybody pulls their money together for a common goal, and they share in the profits. So let's take a look at apartment valuations. So multifamily valuations. So again, it's based on the income and not on the comparables, and it makes sense. So if you think about it, if these two properties were side by side on the same exact street, same everything, same number of units, same age, but one of them brought in net, net operating income, we'll just call it income, if it made income of 50 grand and the other one made income of 100 grand, which one do you think would be more valuable? Which would you want to buy? Would you want to pay the same price? Of course not. You'd want the one that's making more money. So there's a standard formula in the industry to calculate what a property is worth. And the value is the net operating income divided by the capitalization rate. And I'll get into the cap rate in just a minute, but just to keep things simple for now, if we were gonna value each of these properties, one would be worth 625,000 and the other would be worth 800,000. Identical properties, side by side, same street, same number of units, same age, same everything, but one makes more money than the other, it's worth more than the other. Now what happens if one property is brand new and the other property is 30 years old? They both bring in the same amount of money. Which would you wanna own? Well, probably the one that's brand new because it's gonna have less maintenance, you're gonna attract a higher tenant base. Um, it's just gonna be an easier asset to manage. 
So we need to factor that in. And that's what the cap rate's for. Think of it as like a risk factor. So in this example, say, you know, the brand new property, it's less risk. So the cap rate might be about 6%. Where the 30 year old property is definitely going to have some maintenance issues. It may have lead based paint, which we'll have to take care of. It may have asbestos, which we'll have to take care of. There could be a number of things in this property that um, will uncover. So there's a higher risk. So the cap rate on that type of property might be 9%. So if they each brought in the same amount of revenue, the value of the new property would be 1.6 and the value of the old property would be 1.1. You wouldn't want to pay the same amount for the old property as the new property. So that's how we factor that in. So there's four types of property classes. There's a class A, which is the brand new, beautiful, properties that are just finishing construction they've got the best amenities you know, rooftop pools top of the line fitness centers indoor basketball courts you name it um, it has low maintenance the upper socioeconomic tenant base it's the state-of-the-art facility um, then you've got the class b properties that are 10 to 20 years old they still have some amenities they've got a little bit of maintenance you've got a mix of white and blue collar tenant base Still a solid asset. Class C, you're looking at 20 to 30 years old. Um, there's some basic amenities. There's a, some deferred maintenance. It's an older property. It's going to need some work to get it up to par. You Mostly blue collar, maybe a little bit of subsidized housing in there. Um, it's going to need some capital improvements like a new roof, HVAC systems. Um, so it needs some work. And then you've got your Class D, which is basically your war zones. They're old properties, high vacancy extreme maintenance you've got the drug dealers and it's just they call it a war zone you, you, you don't want to get involved with those types of properties so the cap rates reflect the risk and reward of those properties so for a class a brand new property cap rate might be four to six percent for a class b you know six to eight c eight to twelve d twelve plus and again it comes down to risk and reward what we like to do, we like to play in this B to C space right here, class B and class C. Um, they tend to perform best regardless of what economic cycle we're in. We can get into that a little bit later. Um, so let's talk about an example. So again, the, the point of how they're valued and how we can control the value of the property is this is huge. This is why I love multifamily. I'm not just buying something and hoping it goes up in value over time. I have control. If I buy an asset that needs some work or it's underperforming, I can force that appreciation. It's under my control. So in a 200 unit apartment complex, let's just say we increase the rents by 25 bucks, 25 bucks. This small increase just added $750,000 in appreciation, 25 bucks equals 750 grand that's that's incredible when when i heard this and i saw in practice this is how you drastically build wealth with multifamily. you find these properties they call them value add you go in there you add some value and you increase the rents to market and and the appreciation just explodes and you're not at the whim of the market you're not at the whim of what's going on in the economy you can go in there if you buy it right and force that appreciation. So why now? Let's take a little, little bit of a look at what's going on right now and why right now is a great time to invest in multifamily. So over the last five to six years, the U.S. has become a renter nation. We've got the largest population of renters in U.S. history. If you look to the right of the screen, you can see since 2009, when we had that last bubble with all the, the CMBS products that were garbage, home ownership has gone down, renters have gone through the roof. And it, there's a number of reasons for that, and we'll go through it. So the first is millennials. There's 92 million millennials, okay? So what's going through their head? Well, they're making less income um, since 2000. They've got way more student debt. But most importantly, it's the changing priorities. Most of them can afford a house right now. Um, I've got friends who make very, very good money, could easily afford a, a very nice home, but they prefer to live in the city. They love 
the flexibility of living in the city. They love being able to move if they want. I just had a buddy move to San Diego. Um, you know, an opportunity came up, boom, he moved. Um, so it's just a change in priorities. You know, uh, the millennials are not getting married as early. They're putting off home ownership. It's, it's become this sharing economy, you know, with Uber and Airbnb. And it's more about access rather than ownership. And the baby boomers. So there's 77 million baby boomers. And they're getting to that age where they're retiring, they're settling down, they want to downsize, they don't want any maintenance, they don't want to be out cutting the lawn and dealing with stuff around the house. Again, they want the flexibility as well. They want cheaper living, they want to avoid stresses of selling later, and they want to free up some of their capital. If, if you're sitting on a, just say a $300,000 home right now, you sell that home, that frees up $300,000 for you to make other investments and to continue to produce cash flow for yourself in retirement. Another, again, I mentioned is just the changing priorities across the board, across every economic and socioeconomic class. Um, there's just this decline in home ownership. So this is from the Harvard University Joint Center for Housing Studies. It says, with across the board declines in home ownership rates and delays in major life events such as education, career advancement, marriage, and parenthood, more households of all types are renting their housing. And it has to do with a number of factors. But again, it, it's a preference now. The American dream of owning a home isn't as prominent anymore. Um, folks just aren't seeing the value, especially after the scars that are still healing after uh, the last economic crash when folks just ended up losing their homes. Um, it, it was terrible. So they just they don't care for home ownership they'd rather invest and they'd rather uh, have the flexibility so looking ahead over the coming decade the number of millennial renters is going to double to 22.6 million and growth in the adult population in general will be enough to drive an additional 4.4 million rental households by 2025 so yes it's gone up from 2010 to now and it's only going up from here on out that's exactly what this is saying. And again, it's from the Harvard University Joint Center for Housing Studies. So now that we've talked about kind of how apartments are valued, why we love them, what's going on in the market, let's, let's get to the blueprint. That's why you guys are all here and gals. Um, so the blueprint for indestructible wealth, I like to keep it simple and I break it up into three categories here. You can see it at the bottom. So you've, you've got to choose the right market, you've got to build the right team, and you've got to select the, the right property. So targeting a growth market. So job growth is the leading indicator that we look for and what all successful multifamily investors look for. Job growth equals population growth, which equals housing demand. It's basic uh, economics, supply and demand 101. If you've got 100 people, moving to a city and there's only 50 homes, then they're going to compete for those 50 units. Landlords can charge more because they know if one person says no, the other person's willing to pay. Now what happens is, as jobs come in, more people come in, demand for housing grows over time, developers come in and they start building all these new units. Now eventually that equilibrium of uh, renters and units available reach a plateau and then that's when things get into trouble when you start overbuilding because um, when you have more options when there's not enough people to fill those units then you run into trouble and what also is going to happen in the next few years because developers are not building class B and class C properties they're too expensive to build they're building brand new beautiful state-of-the-art facilities because they need the rent premiums to cover their costs of, of, of spending the money. These are 40, 50, 100, 200 million dollar projects. They can't spend that money on a B and C property because the revenues just won't support it. So over the coming years, the class A properties are going to take a hit because there's too much competition. And once all the units come online, there'll be uh, more units than there are available people that make that kind of income that can afford those types of properties. Regardless of what happens in the economy, blue collar workers are going to live in B and C properties. If, if the economy goes up, 
and things are going well, they may move from an older C property into a B property. And if the economy goes bad, you know what? Some of those A's are going to move into B's and the B's are going to move into C's. So as long as we, as long as we play in that B and C space, we can wield any economic uh, downturn or um, upturn in the economy. Because as long as you play in the middle where 95% of renters live, regardless of what happens, they, they still need a place to live. So some things to look for, you want a di diverse economy. If you were investing in Detroit a number of years ago, and which was heavily dependent on the automotive industry, and then the automotive industry tanked, well, then there's no, there's no jobs to support the people living there, and then everybody leaves. So look for a diverse economy. Look for multiple industries, healthcare, tech, uh, professional services, banking. Look for more than one major industry in a market. That will help um, mitigate the risk of any, any issues in the economy and, and will keep renters in your city. Look for population growth of 2 to 3% over the past 2 to 3 years. So that means people are already moving there, jobs are already coming in there, and uh, the economy is on the move in the upward direction. Look for an, uh, a city with at least 100,000 residents. And now this, this blueprint is based on our formula where basically we go in, we buy a property, we add value over three to seven years, we either sell it or we refinance it. So th these are midterm plays. If you're planning on buying a property and you're going to hold it forever, let the residents pay off the mortgage and then you're just going to hold it for cash flow. This isn't quite as important as important um, because you're looking for cash flow. But what we're trying to do is maximize our cash flow and maximize our upside when we go to sell or refinance. So you're always going to think, what's my exit strategy when I go in and purchase this apartment complex? Who's going to buy it on the other side? Um, so that's why we want to be near a, a major city with a, um, a major airport with at least one carrier um, because that's going to attract more buyers at the end of the deal. If you go into some remote town and you buy a 150-unit complex and there's only one or two complexes there, there's you know 10,000 people there, there's not too many people that are going to come and buy that property from you in the future. So again, just plan your exit strategy at the acquisition. So the next piece, and it, this may be the most important piece to a, a long successful track record in, in investing in real estate, you need to build an expert team with experience in whatever market that you are investing in. Real estate is a team sport. You talk to any real estate mogul and they will tell you flat out, there is no way you are doing this business on your own. It's just not happening. There, there's too much going on it's too complex to do on your own so you're going to want a team of brokers property managers attorneys lenders inspectors accountants insurance providers other investors you can partner with on a deal if i know i want to be in dallas fort worth and i don't have a presence there yet well maybe to get my presence in that market i'll go partner with somebody that has a thousand two thousand three thousand units in that market, leverage their teams, their experience, and their footprint in that market to start to build my presence there. So think about it that way. This is a, this is a team game here. Don't feel like you have to go out and do it all on your own. And then the last piece is, is the value add strategy, which I talked about a little bit. You want to buy the right asset. For us, that's we look for a B plus to C property in a B area. So that gives us the best returns with the most protection against a downturn, which I talked about earlier. It's going to produce stable cash flow based on the previous two years' performance. So as it stands right now, before we go in there and do anything, when I buy this property, it's going to make 10% cash on cash. So if I put 100 grand in, it's going to give me 10 grand a year before I even do anything. Smart investors, they lock in their profits up front. And then as the project moves forward, then you build on those profits. People run into trouble 
when they buy based on pro forma and pro forma is based on projections and be very very careful of this going forward in the next few years so what what brokers like to do is say okay well this property brings in a hundred grand right now but we know that the rents are under market here's all the comparables here's all the other apartment communities in this market and here's what they're charging they're they're bringing in 130 grand a year so you should pay a purchase price based on 130 grand a year because all you have to do in is come in and raise the rents and that's where you'll be at this is dangerous and it will bankrupt you never leave it up to chance if the property produces 100 grand base your offer on 100 grand because who knows what's going to happen in the future you may not be able to increase those rents over time if I buy the property though and I know that it'll make 10% today okay if I can't for whatever reason produce any extra value I know I am at least getting 10% on my money which is better than 99.9% .9 of any other investment opportunities out there so that lock in the lock in the profits up front don't buy based on projections or performance only buy a deal with a value play if the deal is 100% occupied and the rents are at market I wouldn't buy it because there's no room for me to force any appreciation the only way that value is going to go up is if something happens in that market which brings in more jobs which brings in more demand which pushes rents up by market appreciation which is all outside of my control I, I would not buy a deal that did not have a value play and that's not just my opinion that's the opinions of several of my mentors that are multi multi-millionaires that have been doing this for decades this is a proven proven strategy um, again I'm not trying to give you advice I am just trying to give you some education and this is my opinion um, and then you want to hire professionals okay so you want to hire professionals for a complete three-phase due diligence process prior to closing so again I, I briefly touched on it earlier we have our, our financial due diligence our legal due diligence and our physical due diligence so when we put a property under contract we say we're gonna buy this property for XYZ here's our letter of intent here is our deposit here's our purchase and sale we go in and we do financial due diligence we say turn over your financial statements for the past two years turn over your rent rolls all of your lease documents all of your contracts with vendors uh, basically open up your books and we're gonna verify everything that you've told us if everything checks out then we say okay we're gonna go in with an inspector and possibly a property management company they're usually happy to do this with you or even for you uh, we're gonna go to the property and we're gonna look at every single unit do not let a seller tell you that you can't get in every unit there's a reason they don't want you in every single unit most of the time yes it's a nuisance and it's a pain in the butt but if they're a serious seller they're gonna know that you want to see every single unit because you're a serious player and you want to know what you're buying and there's no surprises once the documents are signed and the asset is yours so you go in there with professionals document everything if there's issues that they didn't bring up go back to the table and say listen you didn't tell us about this we need to retrade on our price um, and I include this little diagram again at the bottom for the different property types which I already touched about where we like to play in that B and C class space just because that that tends to do the best in uh, economic downturns and economic upturns so here's some different ideas because some of you may be sitting there saying okay that sounds great but how do you just go in there and raise rents how do you just add value so here are some common strategies that you can do to increase the revenue or decrease the the expenses because it again the value of the property is based on the income or the net operating income how much money does it bring in less how much does it cost to run the property that's what it's what that's what the value is based on um, excluding a mortgage as well because some folks may go in there and buy it cash so we can't include the mortgage because then it's not an apples to apples comparison anyway um, here are some strategies to increase your revenue you want to fill your vacancies look for a property where maybe the vacancy rate in this market is 96% but this property is at 90 right now 
okay, great. There's a value play for you. Take the, take the occupancy from 90% to 96%. Okay, great. Um, again, simple one, increase the rents. If, if all of the other properties in the area are at uh, $600 a unit and you're at $500 a unit, well, um, it sounds like there's a value play there. Word of caution though, if you go and take over a property and you say, okay, thank you, I just bought this property, you send out a letter to all the residents, hey, we're raising rents by $100 tomorrow. Uh, or I should say, when your lease expires, your rents are going up $100. Don't be surprised if a lot of residents are going to leave. Um, typically what we like to do is we like to go in there and add value before we increase the rents. Nobody likes to feel stiffed. So if you go in there and say, listen, we're going to do X, Y, Z. We're going to give you a new fitness center. We're going to give you an accent wall on your unit. We're going to upgrade your counters. We're going to do X, Y, Z. We're going to add value to make your living experience better. And in return, we're just going to, we're going to raise the rents about a hundred dollars a month because that's where the market's at. But we want to make sure that you have a great experience and comparable to what the other properties are offering. So in my my opinion, add value before you go in there and just increase rents. Um, some other options, you can add laundry, coin out facilities, um, charge pet fees, parking fees, storage fees, trash concierge. Yes, that is a real thing. Residents will pay you. Rather than take the trash down to the dumpsters themselves, they can leave it outside their door and pay 15 to 25 bucks a month for somebody to come and pick up their trash every week. That is a real thing. Um, Amenity rentals, if you have a movie theater or if you have a common room, you can rent those out for different functions, whether it's the Super Bowl or um, a Christmas party, you can rent those spaces out. You can get cable contracts. So um, in this neck of the woods up here in Boston, um, say uh, it's Verizon Wireless, we'll do the cable. We'll call Verizon and say, hey, we'll give you exclusive rights to this property um, in exchange for X amount of dollars per year. So they basically pay us to be the only cable provider in the building. Um, you can also put a cell tower on the roof of your building, which is what my business partner, uh, his experience has been in the past as a construction manager for a cell site company. So apartment owners can actually generate revenue from uh, cell towers on their buildings. Somebody like a, a Verizon or an AT&T or Boost Mobile will pay you to put a cell, cell site on your roof for reception. Um, you can also decrease your expenses so you can abate your property tax assessment. You can renegotiate property management fees. You can rebid the insurance. You can rebid landscaping, trash. Uh, focus on reducing your utilities through energy efficiency and water efficient upgrades. So those are just a number of uh, strategies that you can implement to boost your NOI and force the appreciation in your property. So I know I've thrown a lot at you over the last 45 minutes. I want to take a step back, take a breather, and show you how you could jumpstart your portfolio rather than go through and do all of this. And you can do that by partnering, like I mentioned, partner with somebody with experience. So right now, you can invest with us. We currently have an opportunity if you're an accredited investor. So accredited investor means you either make $200,000 a year if you're single, 300,000 if you're married, or you have a net worth of $1 million excluding your primary residence. So if you meet those qualifications, and those aren't based on us, that's SEC rules says that we can only raise money from those qualified investors for this opportunity. Um, we have an opportunity for you to partner with us on a deal in the top growth market in the US on a value add deal. Now this lets you get into the deal as an equity owner in the property, you get all the benefits of the direct ownership without any of the work. We have, you leverage our expert teams, our knowledge of the market, um, you'll receive quarterly profit distributions, equity ownership, monthly performance reports, et cetera. Um, so that is one way for you to quickly jumpstart your investing career and leverage um, an expert team in a market that is booming right now. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there. That's one way for you to, to, to boost your productivity and get in the game quicker. However, I will say that you can do this. Um, if you invest the time, find the right mentors, 
and are dedicated, this is absolutely a possibility for you. You can absolutely go out there and do this on your own. Whether you have the capital or not, there are ways for you to do this. I promise you that. Um, this is just an opportunity. If you met these qualifications and you want to expedite it and learn, uh, learn as you grow your portfolio and as you make money, um, this is a great opportunity for you. But if not, um, there are definitely opportunities for you to, to go out and do this um, with the right education. And if you have specific questions, I am more than happy to answer them um, and try and point you in the right direction of how you can jumpstart your career one way or another. Um, so with that, I want to take a step back. Again, I know I've thrown a lot at you right now. And I want to offer up about 15 minutes for questions um, before we end this webinar. And I'm going to throw up a quote here from Warren Buffett. He says, never in a, invest in a business which you cannot understand. Never invest in a business which you cannot understand. So let's, I'm going to check the chat box now and see. We have anybody with questions. Nothing yet. All right. So I am going to continue to to hang out for a few minutes here and see if anybody has any questions. Um, in the meantime, let's talk about some other options for education. I talked earlier about this book right here, Rich Dad Poor Dad. If you have not read it, go get it, read it, study it. Don't just read it, like go in there, underline stuff, highlight stuff. This is gold, absolute gold right here. Uh, we've got some other books up there. Um, we've got courses here that I've spent money on. Um, there's a lot of different um, folks out there who do excellent training. Um, biggerpockets.com is a great website, totally free to sign up. Um, they have a weekly webinar. They have forums. They have, I want to say, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of members um, who strictly focus on real estate. You can post your questions, get tons of responses. I'm on there. There's a lot of other guys that are on there. Um, more than happy to, to, to hop on there with you and answer any questions. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I would add in there. Um, take some time and get educated um, before, before taking the plunge. Um, there's, there's huge opportunities, but I know from my perspective, um, when I'm working with somebody, with an investor, before I, before I take any money from them and before we go through the process, one, I want to learn what their goals are. And two, I want to help them get educated on the process because I, I truly believe in that quote from, from Warren where you should only invest in what you understand and what you're comfortable with. Even if it's at a high level, you should have some idea. You know, so many people right now, they're turning their money over to a 401k or to a financial advisor and they have no clue where their money's going. And it, it may look good on paper. And again, it was shame on me, and I'm glad I caught it when I caught it. But, um, you know, really start to take an interest in, in where your money's going, pay attention, and ask questions. Why is my money going here? What have my returns been? What are your fees? Fees will eat up a ton of your money. And over the long term, this has a, a major impact on, uh, on your ability to be financially free. I'm going to find this quote that, um, was from a book that I read. It was phenomenal. Uh, let's see if I can find it here. Bear with me for one second. It's actually really scary, um, but I, I want to share it with you. But, uh, okay. okay. See if I can throw this up on the screen here. Maybe not. Um, so basically, um, it's from the Social Security Administration. It says, of all Americans that are age 65 in the U.S. right now, 
69% are dependent on family and friends or charities. 29% are still working. And only 2% of people 65 right now are financially independent. 2%. That is scary. That is scary. And it just shows you that you can't rely on the government. It doesn't matter who's in the office. It doesn't matter what else is going on. You need to take ownership of your financial future, period. Nobody else. Because at the end of the day, if you turn your money over and you just blindly say, okay, well, hope, hopefully something good will happen and in 30, 40, 20 years when I go to retire, there'll be enough in there. Well, if that day comes and there's not enough in there, complaining about it isn't going to do anything. So take the time now, get educated, figure out what's going to work for you, come up with a plan, implement the plan, and stick to it. All right, I'm going to check the chat one more time, see if there's any other questions. And then I think we're going to call it a day. So I hope you guys found this valuable. Um, you can find me at my website. It is www.snacap.com. Throw it up here on the screen real quick so you guys can check it out. I can find it. Uh, maybe not. I think I just broke the uh, the webinar session here. Anyway, it's snacap.com. You can find me at michael at snacap.com. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Um, we're going to be doing a lot more of these. We'll probably dive deep on um, how to choose a market, how to invest with an IRA. Yes, I didn't mention that today, but you can actually invest with a self-directed IRA. Um, maybe a little bit more. Maybe we'll run the numbers on a few deals, um, help you guys analyze some deals. Um, yeah, so we've got a lot of good stuff coming in the works. In the meantime, um, feel free to reach out. Again, michael at snacap.com. If you are accredited again and you would like an opportunity to invest alongside us, we'll be closing the funding on that deal in two and a half weeks. Um, so there are a couple slots left if you are interested. Um, so feel free to reach out to me. Again, michael at snacap.com. Otherwise, thank you again for tuning in. I commend you for taking action, spending this lunchtime with me. Enjoy the rest of your day. Have a great weekend, and we'll talk to you soon. Take care.